안녕하세요. Um, it is a huge honor for me to be here. So I just want to very, very briefly thank. Can we have the uh, the stage lights down, by the way? Thank you kindly. I'd just like to thank uh, Jae Wong Shi and Daom. I'd also like to thank the the Lyft folks. Um, it is a huge, huge honor to be here. I'm just absolutely delighted. So the talk tonight is about um, high quality experience in the city, uh, how we can best create the sorts of experiences in metropolitan space, in large cities, um, in a technological environment that creates great potential and great opportunity for this sort of thing, and also creates great threat. So it's basically, again, a conference about the challenges and opportunities of technology in our society, specifically with reference to the city. So I'm going to speak a little bit about how I learned to be an urbanist, why I personally care about the city so very much. I was raised in the tutelage of a woman named Jane Jacobs, who wrote a book in 1959 called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. An architect named Christopher Alexander, whose most famous work is called A Pattern Language. And of course, Bernard Rudofsky, who very famously wrote books called Streets for People and Architecture Without Architects. These people were all operating in the late 1950s, early 1960s, up to about 1968 in the case of Christopher Alexander. And what they had in common was a generosity of spirit. They loved urban places. They loved the organic, the um, vernacular, the self-arising, the things which people did without the, under, without the tutelage of formal schools of architecture, without the tutelage of former, formal schools of urban planning, to create the most resonant and the most heartfelt sorts of urban spaces. They really understood the magic of the street. And when I speak about this, I'm bearing in mind that most of what I'm going to be discussing is most relevant to the North American case and drives its lessons from the European case. Not necessarily so very relevant to Seoul, as we'll see in some important contexts in a second. But all three of these architects and thinkers had in mind a model of urban life that was intimate, that was social, that was daily, humble, but very, very real, that they got a lot of emotional sustenance from the sorts of unplanned encounters that happened on the street all day long. The, the life of the place was expressed through the commerce. The life of the place was expressed through the rhythm of people meeting each other and the things that they did there. Um, a very, very beautiful take on urban life in mid-20th century. And here's a quote that expresses that. This is from Bernard Rudofsky. For centuries, the street provided city dwellers with usable public space right outside their homes. And he expressed the threat this way. Now, in a number of subtle ways, the modern city has made streets which are going through and not staying in. And this was the threat as it appeared to architects and urban thinkers like this around 1960. The threat was coming from cars and traffic and a post-World War II model of urban planning, which was very, very much devoted towards the needs of commerce and the needs of the, the, internal, the internal combustion vehicle, the car, most highly typified by a master planner by the name of Robert Moses, who very famously planned New York City with an iron fist. He put bridges where he wanted bridges, parks where he wanted parks, highways where he wanted highways. He wasn't particularly concerned about the organic nature of the communities that these highways were to replace. He was mostly concerned about the macro scale. And of course, we've managed to destroy, at least in North America, at least in, in Western Europe, we've managed to destroy the sense of the street, that kind of lovely, vivid, humble sense of life on the street without overplanning, without even much in the way of traffic. We've done it differently. Now here's where perhaps some of the difference between North American cities and, for example, Korean cities emerges. One of my absolute favorite things about walking around Seoul is that you can still see two or three adjoshi taking a stoop in front of a building and sitting there and playing paduk on their lunch break in this very spontaneous, very um, immediate way that we don't see so often in the United States, for example. And so I would begin to argue that a lot of what I'm talking about is relevant here, but not perhaps precisely in the same way as it would be to the New York context. And I'm going to show you what New York looks like at this point in time. This is Manhattan right now. 
This is a fairly typical repeating street grid of the Manhattan landscape. You have a bank, a donut branch, a nail salon, a drugstore. All of these are franchises. They're all part of, for the most part, they're part of national brands, national chains. They don't necessarily respond to the local conditions of the street or the community. This is part of the uh, theory of junk space that's been articulated so famously by the architect Rem Koolhaas, who you see over there on the left. Um, the alienation of repeating places, places without any nature of their own, places without any essence. Perhaps you've seen the film Lost in Translation with Bill Murray is on the right, um, which in the Japanese context um, does a great job of illustrating the problem of non-place and junk space. The places where most of us spend so much of our lives transit terminals, hotels, waiting rooms, malls, anonymous spaces without any character whatsoever. So these are the contours of the problem as I see it. This is not an urban condition that I particularly find very interesting nor would want to live in. This to me is the city without everything that makes the city great or interesting. The problem is even worse than that though. Especially in the post-September 11th era, you see a very, very high level of demand to make the city actively unpleasant, to go beyond merely the commercial factors that make a place less congenial, and take steps to actively make it less pleasant. There's a geographer who works in Canada named Stephen Flusty, who's thought about this a lot, and he's identified several qualities of urban space that make it less pleasant. He calls them stealthy, slippery, crusty, prickly, and jittery. And these are active measures that have been taken. This is a, a mailbox in England that has spikes on it so that people can't sit on it. <laughs> a park bench from Tokyo, which has been designed, I don't know if you can see that, the park bench has been designed at an angle like that, so it's impossible to sit on comfortably. And the, the armrests are there so that nobody can sleep on it. And finally, this is a fairly typical security measure in the post-September 11th era a building which has this encrustation of security apparatus around it, including this automatically lowering and raising system and the gates. These spaces have gone beyond being unintentionally ugly and unusable to the point where they're an active insult to the citizen of the city. And this creates, or at least co-participates in creating, something that's happening from the other side, from the technological side. In New York, in North America, and I watched the other day, I sat outside a subway station and I watched, and, and mind you, in New York, we don't have what you have here in Seoul. We don't have uh, wireless repeaters down in the subway system. So people aren't able to use their mobile devices down in the subway. So it's a, actually a very good place to sit and watch is a subway entrance. Because as you have people coming up out of the system, you, you see them coming out of the community of other people and immediately either putting on their headphones or, or getting on their wireless devices and we don't necessarily have etiquettes that have adapted to this. Um, we see people retreating into the sphere, the personal sphere of technology, rather than participating in the community of the city. It's a vicious cycle. I would argue, in fact, that we've lost something real, and we know it in our bones. This is what we're gonna wind up with, I'm afraid, if we don't do something and do something fairly quickly. An ugly, anti-human, uninhabitable place where we're each isolated in our own spheres of technology and very rarely acknowledge the presence or the demands of the other. However, nostalgia is for suckers. It's not 1961, it's not 1968, it's 2007. And I personally, I'm, I'll be damned if I'm gonna sit around for the rest of my life complaining about things. And I don't think you want to either. I don't think you want me to complain about things either. I think we would be best advised to articulate some positive solutions. This is the challenge. How can we rediscover all of those amazing things that made the city of Jane Jacobs and Christopher Alexander and Bernard Rudofsky so vital, so human, and do so in a way that's organic to the technological and the social possibilities that exist at this moment in time? How can we do so in a way that's authentic to us, to 2007, to here, or to Geneva, or to Paris, or to New York, and not some idealized city of the mid-1960s. I think technology provides, at least in part, some hope. This is the specific technology I mean. 
Um, last year, I did write a book called Everywhere, and you see it over here in its English and French translations. And by the way, if there are any publishers in the house, I'd be very interested in seeing it translated into Korean. Everywhere is about what you call in Korea ubiquitous, as in the ubiquitous dream house, the ubiquitous projects that various Korean technology companies are proposing, including the ones that are being built in Songdo. Informatic systems that are embedded in the objects and surfaces of everyday life, potentially even woven into clothing, appearing in public space, that communicate with one another wirelessly, that are imperceptible, that are hard to see, and that begin to escape from our ability to detect them with ordinary vision, and that are radically post-GUI, that are not used with menus and pointers and mouses, but respond to things like voice recognition, gesture recognition, even perhaps the pattern of our movement through space. I would argue that everywhere is already Im implying the way that cities work, the way cities are shaped, and the way we experience them. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to race through a lot of this because I'm trying to fit a 90-minute presentation into a 20-minute slot. But I have a sneaking suspicion that in this class of technologies that I call everywhere, lies one of the answers to the challenges of urbanism. So, toward an ambient informatics. In everywhere, we begin to see information processing leaving computers as we've known them behind and appearing instead in the world, in all kinds of new places. So we see, for example, here, the Nike Plus iPod Sport Kit, which is an accelerometer and an RFID transponder that live in your shoe. And when you go running, conveys biometric information through your iPod to the World Wide Web. We see a variety of sensor systems that are perhaps buried beneath the flooring and are capable of reading the pattern of our footfalls as we move through space and determining with a fairly high degree of precision who we are. We see fairly conventional technological interfaces that in fact correspond through the World Wide Web, through the internet, to this entire sphere of devices we're talking about. And finally, we see a new generation of um, biomedical devices. This is something called the body media senseware patch. It's kind of like a bandage. You slap it onto your arm, it adheres, your body heat turns it on, and it begins picking up and transmitting 16 channels of biometric information. So information showing up, information processing showing up at the scale of the body. Information processing also showing up at the scale of the city. And we see here a variety of public transit interfaces, traffic management interfaces, and in fact a lamp post in Tokyo that has an RFID-based reader in it so that when you wave a mobile phone past it, it says, hi, I'm lamp post number 651 of Shinjuku Ward in Tokyo. There's a woman's west restroom 150 meters ahead on your left, and there's an entrance to the subway 200 meters ahead on your right. We also see information processing beginning to dissolve into human behavior. And this is what I mean by that. What we see here on the screen is the uh, Hong Kong subway system's octopus card. Octopus was originally, like T-Money, designed to be a touchless payment system based on the RFID. And as you know from using T-Money, you slap it onto the reader and you move through this turnstile. It turns out in Hong Kong, the range of the reader is wider than it is here in Seoul. And so the most beautiful adaptive behavior has emerged in response to this. You see young women leaving their transit passes in the bottom of their handbags. And instead of taking the card out and putting it directly on the reader, they're able to swing the handbag over the reader and keep moving past in real time. In about a third of a second, a very elaborate choreography of transaction between the card, the reader, the account. All of this has happened inside a third of a second the woman doesn't even break her running pace. Okay, So all of this information processing has dissolved into behavior. And I would argue that this is the characteristic mode in which we will increasingly be interacting with our digital devices. It won't be something that we focally attend to the way we attend to a mobile device. It certainly won't be something that we attend to the way we attend to a laptop or a desktop computer. It will have dissolved into behavior. At the same time, we see fairly conventional visualizations of activities about cities and the patterns of their use showing up in new ways. So we get, for example, Stamen Design's cab spotting project, where GPS devices in all of the taxis in San Francisco locate in almost real time where the taxis are, 
and wind up drawing a very interesting map of San Francisco that doesn't necessarily 100% resemble the conventional map. We see a variety of economic data, housing prices data, pollution data, the mapping of Wi-Fi hotspots, all of these showing up as ways to think about our urban spaces and ways to reach into them and adjust them in real time that we haven't had before. We see all of this information in a context called ambient informatics, in which all of that information actually comes to you locally when you're actually walking down the street in real time, on demand, and in a way that it can be acted upon. So that if you have a standard conventional visualization of crime in a neighborhood, that's interesting to look at on a laptop when you're at home. But if you're actually looking at it as you're walking down a street and it says you're about to enter a high crime region or a high pollution region, when it's presented to you ambiently where you are then, you have the ability to act on that. You can change your behavior in response to the data. And I would argue that this is a very powerful and very novel way of conceiving of the life of cities that we've never been able to do before in human history. How does this change urban form? It changes in a lot of ways that I'm not going to have time to tell you about. Um, but I'm going to go very, very quickly through it. It changes the shape of buildings and the ways that buildings can be engineered. This last one over on the right is actually a building that moves and shapes itself in real time in response to the wind and the movement of people within it. It shapes the circulation of people, cars, traffic, goods, material inside the city itself. It changes things into any potential surface can now be addressable, scriptable, or queryable. You can have an IP address for every surface in the city. You can project text onto it, just like we see here at the Galleria in Akujombo. But the bottom line here is that this is a city that responds to the behavior of its residents and other users in something like real time. And I think this is radical. The city, in fact, is the platform. There are downsides to this. We will see new inscriptions of class and other kinds of privileges we will see an over-legibility in which there's actually too much information. And all of the social relations that we've evolved over time based on a supposition of there being not that much information in the world break down when there's too much information in the world. And we'll see the standard technological default cases. This is an automatic traffic control system that's inadvertently deployed through somebody's car and in fact killed the driver. The upside is that we have more efficient and therefore potentially more sustainable models of resource utilization. More information when it's designed correctly, and this is very, very important, more information doesn't have to mean more stress. We see Seoul Station over there, London Airport over here, there is in fact more information being presented to the passengers in Seoul Station. But because it's been designed with sensitivity to their needs, and because it's being designed in such a way that it's consistent, they're actually clearly, from their physical postures, more relaxed than the people waiting nervously in London Airport. Not going to be able to talk about this. Not going to be able to talk about this. So how do we do this? Um, I would argue that we have to build our spaces as well as our services with lots of hooks to plug into all of the other informational infrastructures around us. This very much includes what's called an application programming interface. I very strongly believe that APIs and other forms of inter-device and inter-service communication should be open and free. Wherever possible, I believe that open standards should be used that allows people to bring their systems online and plug them into the others quickly, rapidly, and as efficiently as possible. Underspecify, underspecify, underspecify. I'm not going to be able to explain what I mean by that. I just don't have time, and I apologize for that. So some very tentative conclusions. Ambient informatics will help us make better choices about the cities we live in. But awareness cuts both ways. Entirely new behaviors and ways of using the city will emerge. This is a woman in a shopping mall in Singapore. I don't know if you can see her, but she's on her mobile phone. We've all done this. I've done this. She's not responding to the physical space at all, except as a very, very crude container. She's responding physically to the conversation she's in. It's something that I think of as schizogeography. It's a new kind of way of interacting with physical space that we haven't seen before, but we'll be seeing a lot more of. Will we get a passive, participat quote unquote, participatory urbanism? Or will we get a genuine art urbanism in which we are asked to help create the spaces and the communities that we inhabit? The answer, I believe, is up to us and what we do now. I believe that we should have systems for cities 
but cities for people. Thank you very much.